Naomi Osaka has been in the headlines for the past few weeks after breaking her silence about the French Open media boycott, appearing at the ESPYs, a personalized Barbie doll, her Netflix documentary, and now covering on some big magazines. After covering Vogue Japan last month, Osaka now stars on the Hong Kong edition of the magazine, where she discussed her aspirations and the unique pressure of playing a solo sport. Then most recently, she graced the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit issue. This year's magazine theme is opening eyes, speaking truths, and changing minds. Minds, all three stars making history. Naomi is the first Haitian and Japanese woman to cover SI. Megan Thee Stallion is the first female rapper to land the cover, and Lena Bloom is the first transgender cover star. MJ Day, Sports Illustrated Swimsuits editor in chief, talked about Osaka's inclusion as a cover star this year. What drew us to Naomi was her passion, strength, and power, geared toward consistently breaking down barriers when it comes to equality, social justice, and mental health. She is wholeheartedly dedicated to achieving the impossible and has succeeded time and again. We are so honored to have one of the fiercest female trailblazers in history as one of our 2021 covers. A lot of people applauded Naomi for her recent covers, but she received quite a bit of criticism as well. Conservative commentator Clay Travis shared an article by OutKick titled, Introvert Naomi Osaka can't talk to the media, but she's on the Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover. The article's title was pretty self-explanatory, as the writer felt that if Naomi truly struggled with mental health issues, she wouldn't be in the spotlight on these covers. American journalist Megan Kelly quote tweeted Clay Travis adding that Naomi covered both Japan and Time. Kelly, by the way, was the talk show host at Fox News for 13 years before having her own show at NBC, which was terminated after one year, when Kelly questioned why it's considered racist for white people to wear a black face on Halloween. Naomi clapped back at Megan, quote tweeting, Seeing as you're a journalist, I would have assumed that you would have taken the time to research what the lead times are for magazines. If you did that, you would have found out that I shot off my covers last year. Instead, your first reaction is to hop on here and spew negativity. Do better, Megan. Afterwards, Megan tweeted, Poor Naomi Osaka blocked me while taking a shot at me. Guess she's only tough on the courts. She's apparently arguing that she shot her many covers before publicly claiming that she was too socially anxious to deal with the press. Truth is, she just doesn't like the questions she can't control. Admit it. So Megan seemingly acknowledged that Naomi shot the covers before the whole French Open debacle, which she should have known in the first place seeing that she's involved with the media. Even I presume that many of these things were done months in advance, and Naomi even revealed that she shot the Sports Illustrated cover in December of last year. It seems that Megan's just irresponsibly playing into that narrative that Naomi is exaggerating her mental health struggles, all in an effort to avoid critical press. Many people defended Osaka and gave Kelly a piece of their minds. Martina Navratilova, for example, calling her an a-hole. However, quite a few others share Meghan and Clay's sentiments. Infamous British journalist Pierce Morgan's agrees, saying, Yep, and she just blocked me too. The only media Miss Osaka wants to tolerate are sycophantic magazine editors telling her how perfect she is. Now I'm going to once again give my thoughts about that whole press conference boycott because I feel like it explains a lot. Whenever Naomi doesn't perform as well as she wants to on the court, she's affected mentally, which was the case ahead of the French Open. Naomi's sister Mr. Mar revealed that much of Osaka's reasoning behind not talking to the press was that she didn't want to hear about her inferior clay court record. Once again, the problem for Naomi wasn't with the media itself, rather the fact that she was required to talk to them in the first place when she wasn't in the right mental health space. Osaka says this herself in the Time interview published a few weeks ago. Perhaps my actions were confusing to some because there are two slightly different issues at play. In my mind, they overlap and that's why I spoke about them together, but let's separate them for the sake of discussion. The first is the press. This was never about the press, but rather the traditional format of the press conference. I'll say it again for those at the back. I love the press. I do not love all press conferences. I have always enjoyed an amazing relationship with the media and have given numerous in-depth one-on-one interviews. Other than those superstars who have been around much longer than I, Novak, Roger, Roth, or Serena, I'd estimate that I've given more time to the press than many other players over recent years. I always try to answer genuinely and from the heart. I've never been media trained, so what you see is what you get. The way I see it, the reliance and respect from athlete to press is reciprocal. However, in my opinion, and I want to say that this is just my opinion and not of every tennis player on tour, the press conference format itself is out of date and in great need of a refresh. I believe that we can make it better, more interesting, and more enjoyable for each side. Less subject versus object, more peer-to-peer. -peer. Upon reflection, it appears to me that the majority of tennis writers do not agree. For most of them, their traditional press conference is sacred and not to be questioned.
cautioned. One of their main concerns was that I might set a dangerous precedent, but to my knowledge, no one in tennis has missed a press conference since. The intention was never to inspire revolt, but rather to look critically at our workplace and ask if we can do better. I communicated that I wanted to skip press conferences at Roland Garros to exercise self-care and preservation of my mental health. I stand by that. Athletes are humans. Tennis is our privileged profession, and of course there are commitments off the court that coincide. But I can't imagine another profession where a consistent attendance record, I have missed one press conference in my seven years on tour, would be so harshly scrutinized. Perhaps we should give athletes the right to take a mental break from media scrutiny on a rare occasion without being subject to strict sanctions. In any other line of work, you would be forgiven for taking a personal day here and there, so long as it's not habitual. You wouldn't have to divulge your most personal symptoms to your employer. There are likely be HR measures protecting at least some level of privacy. In my case, I felt under a great amount of pressure to disclose my symptoms, frankly because the press and the tournament did not believe me. I do not wish that on anyone and I hope that we can enact measures to protect athletes, especially the fragile ones. I also do not want to have to engage in the scrutiny of my personal medical history ever again, so I asked the press for some level of privacy and empathy the next time we meet. There could be moments for any of us where we are dealing with issues behind the scenes. Each of us as humans are going through some Something on some level. I have numerous suggestions to offer the tennis hierarchy, but my number one suggestion would be to allow a small number of sick days per year where you're excused from your press commitments without having to disclose your personal reasons. I believe this would bring sport in line with the rest of society. Believe it or not, I'm naturally introverted and do not court the spotlight. I always try to push myself to speak up for what I believe to be right, but that often comes at a cost of great anxiety. I feel uncomfortable being the spokesperson or face of athlete mental health as it's still so new to me and I don't have all the answers. I do hope that people can relate and understand it's okay not to be okay and it's okay to talk about it. There are people who can help and there's usually light at the end of any tunnel. So those were Naomi's first statements about the boycott debacle and still, I think the increased expectations and endorsement deal she's encountered recently only exacerbates things whenever she loses or performs poorly now. I think that will be a lot of people's issues and they'll feel like Naomi should woman up like Navratilova said and just deal with it. However, we truly need to understand that a lot of Naomi's identity now more than ever is tied to her on-court success. In her Netflix docuseries, she even said, what am I if I'm not a great tennis player? That to me isn't the mindset to have when it comes to tennis, which is why she needs help in realizing that there's more important things in life than the sport. Once she gets the help to completely comprehend this, the matter will improve, but until then, people need to be more patient. She does seem to be taking steps in that healing direction, and said that she'll take part in news conferences at the Tokyo Olympics in consideration of her mental health. I think no Naomi might receive criticism for the rest of her career honestly whenever she covers another magazine because people don't understand that mental health is not monolithic. It's very different for each individual. Naomi even received complaints about her documentary which only covered issues in 2019 and 2020. I do want to know you all's thoughts about this in the comments. Do you agree with Megan and feel like Naomi only values favorable press or should Kelly and others alike back off? Also, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post my review of Naomi's Netflix documentary. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time here on Grand Slam Tennis News Today.